I find that I haven't always been the best essayist in the past. Where my content here on this channel seems to shine the most is when I'm effectively off the cuff and drowning in nostalgia. This is one of the reasons that for my last attempt at doing an essay for Armitage III, What Animation Taught Us, I went in as raw as I could. But while that one had its merits, overall, it was not my best work. You see, it's pretty much eaten me up inside that I never did give Armitage a proper shake that last time. So when Nando V Movies got together with a bunch of other video essayists on YouTube to create one villainous scene in honor of the Suicide Squad release, and yes, I do realize that that completely dates when this video was released in comparison to when the original idea was brought into my head and all of that stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. They put the call out to a bunch of others to basically join in on the fun. So, I got to thinking. And I really couldn't think of another anime to discuss, another well to return to, other than Armitage III, Polymatrix. Now, <laughs> hold on a second. I already can hear y'all scoff at the thought while heading to your keyboards to write nasty comments about how the OVA is just so much better than that poor excuse for a movie. It was pretty obvious where the opinions of my fellow old school anime lovers lied when I put feelers out on Twitter and a bunch of other social media about their thoughts on whom the heavy was in this film. So you see, why does it matter who the heavy is? You see, in most films, and especially for the essays I've seen so far as part of the playlist, it's pretty obvious who the villain, the bad guy, the heavy, is. In Armitage the Third Polymatrix, it's not quite so cut and dry. So, when a majority of my fellow fans all say that it's the editors, I, I, I just can't agree with that prevailing opinion. Now, now, don't get me wrong. The original OVA was also a masterpiece in its own right. But you see, I do have a case for Polymatrix. As cut up and rejumbled of a story as it was, having been pieced together from the original OVA with a few added scenes and a ton removed, it was a great story in its own right. That case all hinges on this one scene. Oh, and before I forget, uh, did, did I actually warn you about spoilers? Yeah, there, there's going to be spoilers. So um, it's best to come back later if you care about being spoiled for an anime that's a little over 20 years old at this point. But um, if not, let's, uh, let's get started. Ah! 
his work, Lieutenant. And don't try and bill me for that bike. To really talk about the scene as a whole, as well as my argument for both why the movie itself is really good and whom the heavy is, let's make sure we're all up to speed about the story. Armitage the Third Polymatrix is a film about the titular character, Naomi Armitage, and her partner, Ross Syllabus, finding out who was ultimately behind a rash of murders in St. Lowell, the largest city on Mars. Both of them are members of the Mars Police Department, Ross being newly transferred from Earth, and assigned to a special team dealing with technological terrorists. As the story progresses, they find out that these murders are being orchestrated against a new type of robot, dubbed the Third, which can integrate themselves in society completely unnoticed by humans. Essentially, these Third types take on the roles of creative people, singers, actresses, authors, artists, and apparently can also give birth. Mars society is not entirely happy about this, as there is major unrest regarding robots taking human jobs, and the idea of an unlicensed robot type running around masquerading themselves as human just doesn't jive with the current social climate. Through the course of the investigation, which does turn away from finding out who has committed the murders to whom created the third types, as well as why they're being targeted, it is revealed that Armitage is also a third type herself, though one that joined the police force and seems stronger than the others. This happens during a battle between Ross, Armitage, and Dan Claude, the man whom has been murdering the third types up to that point, resulting in his arrest. After this all plays out, though, thirds seem to still be getting killed. The duo eventually find out that there are robot versions of Dan Claude that seem to be carrying out these killings. During one battle, Ross gets heavily injured and nearly half his body gets replaced by robotic parts, a fate that we learn is not the most ideal for someone who hates cyborgs and robots because one killed his last partner and also crippled him. It's eventually revealed that the thirds are based on an assassinroid line that used Dan Claude as a face. They were created to boost Martian birth rates, but now are being targeted for destruction because the Earth is strongly feminist and breeding robots go against the Earth government's stance of basic humanity. In order to ally with the Earth, Mars needed to remove the thirds. This does put a target on Ross and Armitage, whom in the end have to defend themselves against the military before going underground to survive. Let's start with the question about whom the heavy is in this film. At first glance, you might think that it's Dan Claude. After all, between him and his assassinroid clones, they do antagonize Ross and Armitage through much of the story. But that doesn't really paint a proper picture with the film as a whole. They're only in about two-thirds of the picture, and even so, they're really just following orders. So then you have to ask, who is ultimately giving these orders? At first glance, we could then move to the Mars government. They control the military. They're the ones that sent missiles and a battalion of war robots to take our protagonists down in that last pivotal scene that I will get to in a bit. It is also true that ultimately the government of Mars, whom we find out has been using these female robots, the thirds, as a means to create a self-sustaining populace and gain independence from Earth, has essentially been plotting, and as we find out in the end, succeeding in creating an alliance with Earth. But even in this case, Mars is really just doing what it needs to do in order to please Earth. Earth's government is the one that is supposedly feminist and has a stance that robots are property and not human, a stance that seems to be rather prevalent among the citizens of St. Lowell. Earth joining with Mars ultimately is what forces Mars' hand in order to destroy the third types, something they created. Hmm. That, my friends, the idea of we created you, we own you, we can destroy you, is central to the logic that brings me to my ultimate choice for whom the heavy is in this story. Society. 
You see, throughout the film, we are both shown and told time and again that robots are something of a third class to humans. A lot of the social commentary that we see play out through the film centers around the idea of what makes someone human, what makes them real. The general vibe in St. Lowell seems to be that robots are not real. They're property. You can go down a street, walk into a store, and buy your very own robot to do your bidding, designing it to fit your every whim and fancy. They do mundane jobs, which also seems to be a starting point of social unrest with demonstrations and riots in the city. Robots took our jobs! Ross is straight up told by his lieutenant during orientation that if he has misguided compassion for robots, he won't make it in the city. The film paints strong parallels to the way marginalized groups in our own society are treated. Robots are effectively a slave workforce with no real agency of their own. Now, <laughs> a lot of this is, of course, by design. There are the first types, which are the robots that are pretty obvious uh, what they are when you look at them. They're very much similar to the types of robots we even have today. They play roles of security guards, or gadgets as a second type at conception calls them. Military drones, pilots, things like that. Programmed to do exactly what they're told with no real comprehension available to them. Then there are the second types. These ones tend to be more human-like in appearance. They have better speech patterns and AI that can understand and interact with humans on a more natural level. However, they too cannot really think for themselves or comprehend their own existence. They're not designed to. They do more advanced jobs, secretaries, childcare, waitresses, flight attendant, sex worker. Without the ability to understand their lot in life though, to be able to speak up for themselves, they are also effectively slaves. <laughs> the humans in the city certainly treat them as such, collecting piles of robots and burning them on the street, dragging them around half naked on chains wrapped around their necks, buying them in stores and discarding them like you would a broken toaster or last year's iPhone. While we don't really see how Earth treats robots, save for some comments from Ross, we can surmise that much of the same also happens there. Considering the statement of how Earth believes that robots are not humanity, you can assume that much at least. You can easily see how, in such a society that sees robots as a lesser being, as slaves, people would take the idea of a third type one that can think for itself and pass as a human as some kind of affront to their idea of humanity. Thirds are a threat to that belief. A robot that is designed to basically be human, to do what humans do, to laugh, to sing, to act, to love, to give birth. It throws that whole worldview out of whack. <laughs> as such, it must be purged. It must be destroyed, lest it becomes the truth. It's insanely cruel and hard to think about, but that is the world we are shown in this film, a world that eerily over 20 years later still parallels our own. This society is what Ross and Armitage are ultimately fighting against. They're fighting for their right to exist, their right to be real. The last six minutes of the film tell a whole lot without really saying much beyond a few lines of exposition shared between Armitage and Ross. The combination of visuals and music is what really hammers this whole idea home. The scene starts with a juxtaposition between multiple things all happening at once. First, we have Chairman Everhart, the leader of the Earth Federation, parading around the city to publicize the formation of the alliance between Earth and Mars. Then, we have all the people going about their daily lives, some tuning into the TV to see, others ignoring it. 
Then we have second types abruptly stopping their tasks by getting glued to the TV, seeing something else that the humans are not. And finally, we see Armitage and Ross staring down a brigade of robot soldiers sent to kill them. We see people go about their daily lives, watching the parade, walking down the street, doing their jobs. They're oblivious to the plight of our heroes. Armitage and Ross set out to take on the brigade using robotic armor and Armitage's upgraded battle capabilities. The fight is dire, and at points they seem to be losing. Two people versus 2,000. Odds are not in their favor. Humans so removed from the need to fight to survive, they throw droves of robot slaves into the desert to kill two people, unwilling to dirty their own hands. There's a massive war being waged, all the while society keeps on moving as the parade continues. Up until this point in the film, all the fight scenes have been accompanied by fast-paced tracks to match the action. Here, however, we are presented with a track aptly named Silent War. It's a solemn tune, with a hint of hope in the organ that just keeps on moving with no real end. The music just fades out after all the other sounds fade into it, taking center stage, as if to signify that this war will never end. But there is one group that seems to play audience to the battle, the seconds we see fixated on the TV appear to be watching, almost helpless to look away. That fight. We see flickers of static, flickers of the parade, and shots fading in of all the thirds that were killed and of Ross and Armitage's plight. The people around them are confused. They try to drag them away with no movement, others opening them up to diagnose an issue. Some just looking on in awe. All the while, the parade continues. We see the end of the parade and the politician shaking hands triumphantly. The wreckage of robots strewn across the desert as the sun sets, people continuing to move about oblivious to that silent war. The music fades and we are left with a barren landscape at night as we see Ross standing on a hill overlooking St. Lowell with Armitage in his arms, possibly dead. He says a few lines, showing his growth as a character, as Armitage posits the possibility of making room for a child. They head off down into the city together to face whatever fate is in store for them. Finally, we are shown a street in the city, people going about their business. The screen pans to a shot of the ground where a flyer lies. The flyer is of McCannon, the country western singer and third whom was killed at the beginning of the movie during the inciting incident. People walk by the flyer until someone eventually steps on it, crumbling it a bit, and then continue to move on. She is forgotten. The thirds are forgotten. Society moves on, and we fade to black. <laughs> now, I, I know you must be thinking, but Nat, isn't all of that, save for that night scene on the hill, already part of the OVA? And if so, what's so special about it here in the film? You see, it's where the scene is in this film that really clenches it. That ending shot with the flyer, that was actually the end of episode one of the OVA. McCannon's case was basically over after that point in the OVA, and by having it end that episode, all it really tells us is that McCannon is the one that's being forgotten. There's still three more episodes of story and other thirds. By moving that scene to the bookend of the film, as a whole, it gains a completely new meaning. You see, the true villainy of this whole scene, and yes, I do know that I'm using the term scene pretty broadly to describe the last six minutes of the film, 
is all about that juxtaposition hammering home just how hopeless the fight really is. While, sure, Armitage and Ross make it out alive, just like the rest of the thirds, just like McCannon, they are forgotten. Society moves on. Their fight didn't change anything. The treaty between Earth and Mars was still signed. The military was still using robots to do their dirty work. The people of the city still continue about their daily lives with no real care or even knowledge about Armitage and Ross's silent war. They were forgotten. <sighs> that <laughs> that was a trip um yeah hi uh nat here um this video has definitely been one that i have been working on for a considerable amount of time many many rewrites many many re-recordings all to try and come up with um, some way to tell this story in a sense that I am satisfied with. And to be honest, I probably never will be fully satisfied with um, my delivery or anything. I'm <laughs> constantly changing, um, constantly growing, and constantly working towards whatever um, my ultimate um, goal and place is going to be, which um, is, is a good thing. But um, yeah, there, there comes a point where you just gotta decide to cut your losses, so to say, um, and uh, just finally come out with the stupid video girl already. Uh, <laughs> so here it is. Um, I really hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that um, I was able to get my point across to you of what I was trying to say with all of this. Um, it's, uh, it's been a journey, and um, hopefully uh, there are more journeys for us to take in the future. Um, I really did actually enjoy doing this kind of video essay thing. There, there are definitely a lot more things I would like to talk about, about Armitage the Third in and of itself, as well as many other things. Um, I mean, this past year we've seen quite a lot of interesting things happen in the world, as well as the anime world and other things. Um, Daft Punk splitting up uh, was a major impact to me, and I want to talk about it. Um, because of just the influence the Daft Punk itself had on me, as well as just how cool and interesting the storyline of Interstellar 555 is. And unfortunately, it's hard for me to talk about Interstellar 555 without also talking about the Discovery album, which then brings me into my discussions about Daft Punk and where I am and how I interpret things. And there's just a ton of stuff that... <laughs> I actually would love to get off my chest and so I'm working on quite a few different things to hopefully be able to do this more frequently. Um, hopefully the next one doesn't take uh, nearly six months to produce and get out the door. Um, I'm working on a lot of different things to try and make this more interesting um, than hope and potentially what this currently is. I've of course had tons of hiccups this past year, things that I can talk about. Um, we went to Yomacon again uh, this year. Um, we, it finally was back this year, so I got a chance to visit Otaku Joe's booth. So I have tons of laser discs and other things that I could talk about, upgrades to the room, upgrades to the desk. Um, I have a potential way to basically bring my um, you know how like the last couple of years I've done videos in front of my computer um, rather than in front of the uh, wall of anime um, at the table I would like to bring the table back and I think I found a way to potentially do that here soon um, considering my that table has basically become my work from home space um, as I do work from home a good portion of the week now <laughs> lots of things changing this year um, it just 
I, I want to thank all of you who have continued to support me through all of this, through my sparse uh, release schedule, through the multiple hiatuses while I'm sitting there trying to get my head on straight and really kind of um, get my creative juices back in order to do more content for this channel, more interesting content for this channel. I mean, the pickup videos are fine and all, but it's... It, it, it's simple and it's quick and that's that's nice but videos like this um, require me to actually have to step out of my comfort zone a little and I really enjoyed that and hopefully you are enjoying it too because um, <laughs> without you uh, sitting here watching me listening to me um, it, is there much of a point in me saying what I'm saying I'm, I, I don't know uh, <laughs> There's a lot of emotion and everything all over the place, but uh, <laughs> I guess um, that is that is my life now, the life of Nat, the old school otaku. Um, things have definitely changed considerably over this past year, and um, I, I appreciate that uh, um, y'all have stuck with me. And if you are new to this channel, if this is the first time you're watching, first time you're tuning in, especially because you tuned in from the uh, villainous, uh, one villainous scene playlist, um, assuming that they actually um, were still adding people to that this far um, beyond the initial release, uh, <laughs> assuming that that, that happens, um, uh, welcome. Um, this video is not necessarily indicative of the type of content that usually is on this channel and has been previously, but I would like to potentially make it more, um, you know, but I'd like to get your thoughts and comments. Um, I'd like to know more about what you think. Uh, would you like to see more of this type of content for me in the future? Uh, would you like to see me go back to doing more uh, pickup videos or maybe do other reviews like I did of the Lupin the Third Jigen's Daisuke? Um, things like that. Uh, let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below. I do definitely read all of the comments and I uh, look forward to interacting with you there. Um, and I'm looking into other methods, other things we can do to interact, to hang out, to chat, to do things. Um, I am pretty extremely active, at least on my personal Twitter. Uh, not necessarily so much on the old school otaku Twitter, but um, I would like to get that back up and going a little bit more. Amongst a whole lot of other things. So, um, yeah. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, I appreciate that um, y'all have stuck with me to this point. Uh, you've listened to me ramble on for uh, a considerable amount of time at this point, and um, I look forward to seeing you all again next time. This is Nat, the old school otaku, signing off. You can go down the street, walk into a store, and buy your very own Raba. <laughs> Oh, let's try that again. <laughs> Drink first. That was too many flubs. Too many flubs. Okay. Uh, what's up, y'all? Nat, the old school otaku here. And I find that I haven't always been the best essayist when it... <laughs> We've got to start it all over again. Okay, let's try this again. <sighs> One <laughs> villainous scene. <laughs>